I mean, take a look politically at you know what it, it, what's happening in America, what's happening in other de- democratic countries, where where the uh, the competing political parties, the competing tribes, no longer honor one another. Right. All you need to do is to you know go back to the the Ray, Ray, Reagan uh, Reagan Mondale debates from the eighties and just look look at those videos of the way they treat one another. The difference between you know what. Th- that kind of politics and the politics we have today, wh- which consists, you know, of c- this constant, constant drumbeat of insult, abuse, slander, dishonoring one another. Look, it's just like a marriage. If you want a divorce, if you want a civil war, then just keep dishonoring the other person. Just keep focusing on everything that's wrong with them, and you'll 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 get your divorce. You'll get your civil war. Hello, everyone watching and listening on YouTube. Uh, I have today with me Dr. Yoram Hazoni. We're going to talk about his new book. He's written a number of books. We're going to talk about his new book, Conservatism, a Rediscovery. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to that. He's quite a scholar of conservative thought, political thought in general. And so I hope to learn a lot today while I have the opportunity to sift through his knowledge Welcome, Yoram. It's good to see you. Hello, Jordan. Good to see you. So let's talk about your book. Why a rediscovery? I think most people at this point have figured out that uh, that we're undergoing some kind of cultural revolution. And uh, I, I, th- I think this hit a high point uh, two years ago in 2020 when, uh, when, when people started getting fired from, from prestigious academic positions and, and, and media positions for holding, you know, regular liberal positions that people have, had had for decades. And uh, I, I wrote this book in order to try to uh, to make some order in this cultural revolution. Uh, these woke neo-Marxists are obviously not liberals. And it seems that the, the old liberalism doesn't have the fight and the firepower to be able to uh, to to uh, roll this back, and the question I think everybody needs to be asking is, you know, wh- what kind of a force would be strong enough to stop it? You know, everybody talks about all the things that the left is doing wrong, and and of course that that makes sense. But if we're thinking about opposition to it, the question is, what what kind of force is going to be strong enough to stop it? And I I think to discuss that you have to go into uh, into conservatism. How would you characterize what's happening on the left? Do you think? I mean, what is what's the nature of this cultural revolution? Since after World War II, uh, I think both in America and and across Europe, uh, there there was a kind of a a, a consensus, which uh, I mean, all the major part political parties, all the ma- ma- major cultural streams, uh, agreed on a kind of a, a liberal framework, and you can call it an Enlightenment liberal f- framework. The basic idea is that uh, that what you need to know about politics is that human beings are by nature free and equal, that they take on moral obligations and political obligations on the basis of consent. And that was assumed to be uh, sufficient in order to you know to, to to guide the political world. So there were there were disagreements within liberalism, progressive liberalism and 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 uh, libertarianism and classical liberalism, but the basic framework held for 60 or 70 years. And now the I, I think the most important thing to understand is that 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 liberalism, which you know in a lot of ways it's very well intentioned, it's very, very noble. Um, but but it assumes that children when they're being raised, that they don't they don't need any kind of traditional guidance. They don't need any kind of uh, um, uh, customary framework, guard what, what people call guardrails today, that are inherited and are are uh, t- consciously inculcated uh, by by parents, by churches, by, by by schools. The assumption was, and and I I think for many many parents still is for two generations. The assumption was you tell your kids when they're growing up, look, whatever makes you feel good, uh, whatever fulfills you, whatever it is that, that, you know, that, uh, that gives you meaning in life, that's what you should do, and the important thing is to be happy. And that sounds really nice. 
You know, but as uh, you know, as you know from from your work and your studies, when you raise kids like that, a great many of them uh, s- simply reach a kind of a a, a dead end. They it, whatever makes you feel good. Well, they don't know what makes them feel good, and uh, into that vacuum stepped steps in in a uh, this woke neo Marxist movement, uh, which has answers. It gives people answers, and the the um, uh, the surprise is that you know all of, all of these mainstream liberals thought that if you just told kids use your reason think for yourselves um, figure it out for yourselves we trust you that everybody would sort of come to something normal but it turns out that that's not true when you tell all the young people for two generations just think for yourselves you know whatever looks good to you it turns out that a great many of them are are much more attracted to marxism or and some of them even to fascism than than to uh the the the, the mainstream liberalism so that went on for two generations and now it's collapsed i mean ba- basically 2020 was uh, the the year that the hegemony of uh, the mainstream liberal ideas came to an end there's still obviously lots of liberals running around but in terms of the the assumptions of the society, right right now we actually have this woke neo Marxism seeking to impose a new hegemony, and they're frighteningly close. So it seems to me that you could make a case that classic liberalism worked because it was running on stored cultural capital in some sense. Is that when the institutions that you're speaking about were more or less intact? So that would be church, let's say, family, stable, monogamous, heterosexual marriages, and civic society, membership in clubs and that sort of thing. When all of that was functioning, then in principle, it was possible to treat people like they were autonomous, reasonable individuals, because you had already laid the groundwork for something approximating a shared ethos. But as that evaporated because people became more atomistic and hedonistic, then the shared ethos started to deteriorate and other idea sets became more attractive. Does that seem approximately correct? I, I think that's exactly right. I, I would just, just add uh, the, 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 the loyalty to a, to a national framework, to a nation. So uh, basically, if, if people are raised uh, with loyalties to to family, to a, a a congregation, to to a community, and then to a larger nation, um, then then they know something about where they are. You know, they, they can criticize, uh, they can argue about. You know, how are we going to organize these uh, these loyalties? How can we improve things? But exactly as you said, uh, if they don't grow up with those things, if those things are are are, are no longer clear because. Uh, because the, the the cultural capital, as you say, is running down, um, the inher- the inheritance is basically being spent, and once that inheritance is gone, then then there are no limits. There is no framework. There, there's no common sense. I mean, what we call common sense is is always the common sense of a particular uh, nation or community or family, and once those things have broken down, there is no common sense, and people actually are willing to consider, you know, just about any crazy, evil thing. Big government continues to spend borrowed money, inflation continues to swell, dragging down our economy, and the stock market has entered bear territory. So what's your plan? Are your assets diversified? I'm Philip Patrick, precious metal specialist for the Birch Gold Group. For nearly 20 years, we've helped Americans diversify into gold, and we can help you too. Did you know you can own physical gold and silver in a tax-sheltered account? We can help you transfer an IRA or 401k tied to stocks into an IRA in gold. If you're skeptical about the trajectory of the economy in the US dollar, then text Jordan to 989898. Birch Gold Group will send you a free info kit on securing your savings with gold. With thousands of satisfied customers, five-star reviews, and an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, we take precious metals seriously. Text Jordan to 989898 for your free info kit. So I've been I've been thinking a fair bit about the potential contribution of, of, I would say, 
clinical and counseling psychologists to this mess because there was a tremendous emphasis probably throughout the whole 100-year course of the development, say, of clinical psychology and, and clinical psychiatry on sanity as something, in some real sense, internal to the individual. And so you can see that, I would say, in its most stellar exemplars in the humanist psychologists of the 1960s, and it kind of figures that that would occur in the 1960s, that you were sane and capable of psychological well-being if you were well-constituted psychologically. But I've been thinking more recently that that's not a very useful model of sanity because it downplays the social embeddedness that characterizes people who are psychologically stable and therefore capable of happiness. If you're stable, you're not anxious, you're not completely ridden with negative emotion. That doesn't necessarily mean you're happy, but if you do a careful analysis of what people mean when they say they want to be happy, what they really mean is they don't want to be miserable. And happiness is like the icing on the cake, but they definitely don't want to be anxious and frustrated and disappointed and in pain and confused and aimless and all of that. And so it isn't obvious to me at all that it's possible to be psychologically intact in isolation. I think the most potent proof of that is even that even hardened criminals, antisocial types, find being in solitary confinement almost intolerable. And so if that's the case, you might ask, well, what exactly is social being doing for us? And if you're married, you have someone who's somewhat different than you to keep you in check constantly. Like married couples are throwing back and forth information to each other about how to regulate the relationship and themselves nonstop. That's pretty much all of what communication consists of. And then if you have children or your parents, your siblings, let's say that immediate family, the same thing is happening is that people are monitoring one another and providing each other with feedback about how to behave and how to think. And then that's nested inside a civic community and that's nested inside a state or a province and then that's nested inside a country. And sanity seems to be something like, and maybe all of that's nested inside some religious presuppositions. It's the harmony between all those levels that seems to be essentially what constitutes sanity rather than something that's formally internal. Like maybe your internal structure reflects that external harmony and that's like in a fractal manner, in a holographic manner. And that's what sanity constitutes. And I would say that the liberal emphasis on, say, self-actualization and as the on the atomistic self as the center of the world has deluded itself into thinking that any of that's possible without an intact hierarchy of social structures surrounding the individual. That seems to me to be the weakness, the fundamental weakness on the psychological front of, of even of classic liberalism. I think that's exactly right. And uh, I, I think that you were already um, speaking pretty much to this uh, in, in, in your earlier work, when you were telling you were telling young people, look, um, you need to find you need to find your place within some kind of social hierarchy, and uh, th this is actually the the extension of your uh, your earlier argument. I mean, we, we, both both of us are drawing on on Durkheim's insight that uh, look, if you want to know what is it that leads people to to suicide, then uh, it's anomie, and mm -hmm, what is that? Right. That's the, the 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 lack of a directional sense, a set of guardrails which comes from those nested hierarchies that you're that you are describing. Uh, if the individual now uh, none of this means that uh, that an individual can't you know if he or she is unhappy can't look for a different place in a different hierarchy. But the point is that that wherever they end up. If they're going to be motivated and directed and feel like th their life has meaning and purpose and direction, it's going to be because they have found their place in a hierarchy that works for them. And, and liberalism simply doesn't, simply doesn't uh, touch 
on, on this central human need. By the way, uh, the Marxists are pretty, pretty much aware of this. They do think in terms of hierarchies. Of course, their goal is to destroy them, but at least they can see them. Whereas the, 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 the liberals are always thinking kind of in terms of flatland, that you know, it, 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 by the time you're 18 or 20, then you're equal to everybody. And it, it, the assumption is that everything's level, but, but the truth is nothing is level. The, there are always hierarchies. And people feel good when they found they found the right place in, in in such a hierarchy. By the way, that means that they have something to aspire to mm-hmm. to move up in the hierarchy. They have a, they know they have some idea of where they're going in life. Yeah. Well, you talked about you just spoke of guardrails and direction, and that seems about right to me. I mean, when I worked as a clinician and I was trying to understand what made for a good life, let's say when I was dealing with people who were depressed, because well, often they didn't have the necessary guardrails or direction, and that was part of the reason they were depressed. I mean, depression is complicated, and there's many reasons for it, but it does seem to me to be an incontrovertible truth, and I think that my audiences have responded very well to this proposition that almost all the meaning that you find in your life that isn't merely a consequence of a narrow and... and uh, short-sighted hedonism is found in the service you provide to the people who are in your social networks. And that would be, first of all, obviously, your intimate relationship and your family, and then in the hierarchical uh, nesting, nested structures that, that, that are outside of that, if you're fortunate enough to have them. And the guardrails are that there are codes of behavior that are necessary to, to abide by that constitute adhering to the principles of all of those social relationships. And the direction is whatever the joint venture that you're embarking on with others is directed towards. And I don't see that you do have any structure or purpose in your life in the absence of those things. I mean, if you strip someone of their, let's say, embeddedness within an educational institution or within a job or a career, you strip them of their family, you strip them of all their civic responsibility. I suppose perhaps they have their creative endeavors if they happen to be creative people, but even then they have to be interacting with other people to communicate about their creative endeavors or to monetize them. And without that, there's, well, there really is nothing. And we also know too that psych statistical studies of, of, language usage have indicated pretty clearly that thoughts about yourself are indistinguishable from negative emotion. That's how heavily tinged they are with negative emotion. As soon as you become self-conscious, as soon as you start thinking about yourself, you're instantly anxious and miserable. They're the same thing. And so, okay, and so then on the Marxist front, because we talked about the collapse of liberalism, the fact that liberalism in some sense is an empty concept in the absence of these underlying practices and customs, let's say, where that, that are actually embodied, that you actually act out. They're not conceptual precisely. The Marxists, I think, have an advantage over the liberals, and maybe this is one of the things that accounts for the attractiveness of Marxism to young people, is that the Marxists, at least they have an attitude towards guardrails, which is destroy them, but they also provide a direction, right? And the direction is essentially a revolutionary direction. It, it, it combines a critique of, of hierarchy, concentrating on the idea that hierarchies are intrinsically pathological, but then it also provides direction and group membership. And so that's pretty compelling in the absence of any structure, say, which at least in principle is what would be offered by the classic liberals. Right, but notice that, you know, I mean, this issue goes all the way back to Marx. Notice that the the theory is that that, uh, uh, hierarchical structures and uh, uh, competition between groups always means that there's going to be oppression, and the goal Mm -hmm. is always to to overthrow the dominant hierarchy. But... Notice that Marx doesn't answer Marx doesn't answer the question of what's going to come after the revolution. And he's incredibly vague about it, and this continues to this day, which is that the, the the unspoken truth here 
is that these woke neo-Marxists are masters at creating tight hierarchical structures that people can fit into. That, that, I mean, that, that's, that's the reason that, that, that people get sucked into this woke thing. They, they sound so much like robots and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're constantly repeating you know, precisely the new thing that they're supposed to be saying. And the reason for this is because, because the, their, their own hierarchical structures that they are creating are, are of the, you know, the, uh, the tightest and most disciplined kinds. So, so I mean, the, there is, um, I, I think you can, I think a lot of people sense this, that there, there's a terrible hypocrisy in, in, the whole, in the whole woke thing, in that the claim is that they're, you know, they're, they're bringing social justice by overthrowing existing, uh, existing social structures, existing hierarchies, but they themselves are imposing precisely the same thing that they're well, worse. That they're going to destroy. No, 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 they're imposing something worse. I mean, this is something that's yes. that's very, very striking historically. So, so let let's take the Marxist position apart. The first oversimplification is that there is a hierarchy instead of a multiplicity of hierarchies, because in any reasonably functioning modern society. There are innumerable hierarchies. And part of the reason that we can live without being too crushed by hierarchical difference is because, as you said before, you can move from one hierarchy to another. And that might be something as straightforward as changing jobs. Not that that's particularly easy, but it's not impossible. And so if you can't find a place in one economic structure, microstructure, then you can find a place in another. And I think one of the real antidotes to rigid, uniform, monolithic hierarchy is a provision of multiple games. And I think modern societies do a very good job of that. And, and, then, and so the idea that there's one hierarchy, although you could rank order people by wealth, I suppose, but the idea that there's one hierarchy is preposterous, except under Marxist rule in which case everything does tend to collapse into a single hierarchy that's absolutely monolithic and totalitarian beyond belief. And that just happened time and time yeah. again. So you have to presume that there's some fundamental flaw in the Marxist formulation. And maybe the flaw is something like, look, you have to accept um, a moderate amount of hierarchical structuring. And you have to hope it doesn't get too lopsided so that only a few have everything and everyone else has nothing. That's a pathological situation, although it's not only a consequence of, say, Western economic structures. It's, that is a human universal, that proclivity, or, or natural universal, that power law distribution problem. Now, if you criticize hierarchy to such a degree that you want to destroy all of it, then all that you do is in, instantly produce something approximating the most tyrannical hierarchy you can possibly imagine. Because you destroy the differentiated structures, it's exactly what happened in the Soviet Union and China. You destroy all the intermediary, distributed, multiplicitous structures, and you replace that with tyrant and peasants. That's true, but you know, let, let me push back just just a little bit because I think I think that a healthy society um, it is one that certainly has a, a competition of. Uh, you know, multiple tribes, maybe different religions. I think these things are probably more important to people. People's identities are are, are more tied to uh, to regional, ethnic, religious groups than they are to you know to what what job they have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, what I what I what I meant about you know when I when I said that people can change is that it look it's always possible if you don't if. You, if you don't like your nation, to move to a different nation. If you don't like your religion, you can convert to a different religion. Um, but the, the the bottom line is that uh, thing th that big structures, macro structures like um, like the the the, uh, the the hierarchy that constitutes uh, constitutes a nation. Those are those are the things that are missing. I think from from the liberal picture. Of course, a healthy nation, and and I would here I, I would I would insert the word conservative, is that the the, the difference between uh, between a uh, a Marxist view of uh, the hierarchy 
the hierarchical power structures within nation, nation and a conservative view is that a conservative says, um, look, there's always going to be groups that are more powerful than others. Uh, the, the, there's no such thing as no hierarchy. There's always going to be a competition among groups, and some groups are going to be more powerful than others. You know, like 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 the the uh, uh, the Anglo-Saxon Protestant uh, uh, grouping within the United States for most of its history. And so, so there are going to be groups that are more powerful than others. But that doesn't mean that the most powerful groups have to oppress the other groups. They're in a in a conservative society, there, there's a, an ongoing negotiation among the different groups. You know, there's a jostling and a competition, just like in, in, just like in family life. You know, there, there's a constant bickering and jostling uh, among children for, you know, for position. And even between a husband and wife, the reason husbands, husbands and wife, wives bicker is, is you know, the, the reason they squabble is, is because there's a constant you know, uh, um, tr trying to find a place where where you feel like you're being properly honored, you feel like you're being properly respected, and in a uh, in a traditional um, conservative society, what's going on is that you you inherit certain ways of structuring things, and 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 then you can you can adjust them, you can try to correct them, but the goal of the conservative society is to have a distribution of honors. A distribution of of uh, justices, you know, of, of of what people get and where they get placed within the society, and that distribution, the conservatives claim, it doesn't always have to be evil, like the Marxists say. It doesn't always have to be oppressive. You can have a situation in which uh, the more powerful groups understand that they have a responsibility to the weaker groups, and you can argue about exactly what that is. But a, 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 mutual, a mutually beneficial conservative society is one in which the, the uh, different groups get things out of, out of the collaboration, out of the, the mutual loyalty. It's not just the strong get things and the weak get crushed, but everybody gets things. And I think, I think that a lot of what conservatives are reacting to when they, you know, when they see what the Marxists are trying to, to, to build is that, you know, the, you're trying to grab everything for your group, whereas a traditional conservative society says, says no, the, the, the just balance of honors among the different groups, that's what makes people feel good. That's what makes people loyal to the system. Otherwise, there is no loyalty to the system. There's just oppression. Yeah, well, the Marxists also have the advantage that I would say of two, they have a twofold advantage. First of all, they can appeal to envy, and they're unbelievably good at that. I mean, I think the fundamental motivating force of Marxism is, is envy. Now, it'd be, it'd be a close race between that and desire for untrammeled power, but we could certainly start with envy. And it's very easy for people to be envious of anyone who has more of anything than they do. And one of the things that I've really been struck by on the left is the constant presupposition that if someone has more than me, they got it because they're using power in an oppressive way. It's always the cutoff between the oppressor and the oppressed is whatever status I happen to have as a left-wing intellectual. Because I got what I have honestly and through hard work and diligence, but anybody who has more than me obviously took it from the people who are lesser than them. And so that's definitely an appeal to envy. But there's something underneath that, I think, that is more powerful, which is that, and this is a criticism that conservatism is susceptible to, is that hierarchies do tend to degenerate in the direction of arbitrary power when they degenerate. And every hierarchy is degenerate to some degree, right? Because there's a bit of corruption in everything. And so then the Marxists can point to the corruption, especially if they're appealing to young people, and they can say, well, look at that person in that position of authority and the awful things they did that were oppressive and impro improper. Obviously, everyone who holds any position of authority is corrupt in some fundamental way. And then obviously the whole system is corrupt. And that's given that that critique of corruption has warrant in some sense, it's not easy to differentiate and to say, no, look, guys, you gotta think this through, is that human institutions aren't perfect and you have to be awake all the time to make sure they don't degenerate entirely, but that doesn't mean that they're fundamentally corrupt 
you know, which is the claim, for example, that America was predicated on the uh, on on a positive view towards slavery. It's like, well, obviously, when America was founded, slavery was thriving, and so there was a pro-slavery ethos that was part and parcel of the American project at that point. But the fundamental drive of the system and all of the traditions upon which it was founded was that all men are created equal, men and women are created equal before God. And that was the principle that eventually won out. And it's hard to teach young people, I think, to separate the wheat from the chaff when it's so easy just to throw everything out, especially if there's no immediate consequences, especially when you're lauded for doing so and all your idiot teachers are telling you that's the right thing to do. While today's cups of coffee often come with hints of soy and social justice, our new coffee sponsor delivers an entirely different experience. It's bold, strong, delicious, and overall as good as the causes it supports. I'm speaking, of course, about Black Rifle Coffee. Many of you know about Black Rifle already. It's a veteran-founded and operated coffee company who have made it their mission to hire 10,000 veterans, and they're well on their way. By purchasing for Black Rifle Coffee Company, you're directly supporting the military service community. But what about the coffee itself? Well, it's bold, strong, and really good. Go to BlackRifleCoffee.com and use promo code JORDAN for 10% off your first order or when you sign up for a new Coffee Club subscription. The subscription gives you free shipping on all Coffee Club orders, early access to club deals and promotions, and special discounts from their partner brands. That's BlackRifleCoffee.com with promo code JORDAN for 10% off your first order or when you sign up to become a Coffee Club member. Black Rifle Coffee, supporting veterans and America's coffee. Right, agreed. Um, look, but the the reason that I, um, I that I bothered with the historical chapters in uh, in the conservatism book is is because I I, I think there's a a um, a widespread misunderstanding about about conservative thinkers about Fortescue and Selden and Burke and 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 for that matter you know Washington and Adams and Hamilton. There's kind of this assumption that if you're a conservative, then you you just think that whatever exists is fine and it doesn't need to be repaired. When you actually read these sophisticated conservative thinkers, what you find is that none of them think this. The, the, the actual view is uh, something much more like what you were describing, that there's corruption in everything, but more than that, um, every good system decays. Every good system runs down. This is an, an integral part. You just, you just see, see this over and over again in ang- Anglo-American conservative uh, uh, thinkers, is every system runs down. Every system decays. And that, that's, just, that's just the way human societies are. So the, the principal job of the conservative is not to, um, it, to, to hold on tight to whatever exists. It's to look for uh, restoration. It's to identify what has become corrupt and decayed and to uh, look for a model either uh, earlier in history or sometimes even just, you know, uh, uh, lo- looking at the neighbors the way that, you know, the Pol- the, that during the Polish Revolution, they, 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 they looked to, to, to the British Constitution for, for, for a model. And so the word restoration... It, it's a lot like the word repentance. It's a, restoration is kind of a, uh, is kind of a national political repentance where where you look at something and you say, "Look, this is decayed. We've gone off course, um, or, or or there is an inherited evil that you know can no longer be tolerated, and we have to fix it." And the conservative's job is to find a way to uh, to to uh, make that repair while strengthening the entire system as a whole. So I mean the, the the example of slavery I think is is uh, it's on a, always on a lot of people's minds and I think for good reasons, but it, important to notice that that uh, that the uh, that Britain succeeded in eliminating slavery on the basis of the common law in the 1770s with, without a revolution without a civil war, um, and the uh, what 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 happened is that uh, Lord Mansfield. Um, looked at the you know the integration of the mercantile law over the previous century into the common law, and in a lot of ways that was very good. That's what made it made it possible for you know for for Britain in in a lot of ways to become a 
uh, uh, a, a, a modern economy. But um, the, the, the idea that, that uh, human beings could be bought and sold as slaves was imported into the common law by the mercantile law less than, uh, you know, at the end of the 1600s. And at a certain point, the, uh, the, uh, the, the jurists, the, the judges in Britain looked at this and said, we, what's happening is we are corrupting ourselves. We're corrupting our tradition by allowing this institution of slavery to, to, to be brought into our country. And they eliminated it on the basis of, of British tradition, the, the English tradition. They said, English common law does not does not uphold slavery. A person who is enslaved in in England is always enslaved unfairly. Now the interesting thing is that the Americans, uh, an important part of the Federalist Party's platform during the American Revolution was the um, uh, the the uh, uh, br bringing the English common law uh, in as uh, as as the the uh, the law of the new national federal government. Uh, Jefferson opposed it, Madison opposed it, but the Federalist Party, the conservatives, they thought that they needed this, they, they, they needed this common law inheritance. And, and America, in fact, does, does still have that common law inheritance until this day. Now, w w why is it that, um, that if the English could get rid of slavery, you know, w w without this abstract declaration that, you know, that, that on, all men are created equal. Why is it that the Americans couldn't do it? And I, I, I think part of this is an optical illusion. I think, I, I think that the Americans could have done it, but um, the, the, uh, the strength of liberalism in, in America's founding and, and you know, go, going forward uh, comes from the fact that while uh, uh, Washington and his party were, were genuine conservatives, uh, the, the, the American Constitution of 1787 is basically, in in many respects, a restoration of the uh, of the British Constitution. That's what Wa Washington and his party stood for. Uh, Jefferson and his party, Tom Paine, um, the, these really were Enlightenment liberal radicals, and and uh, uh, Jefferson is famous for saying things like uh, repeatedly uh, that one generation is a foreign country to a to, to, to the preceding generations, meaning that, that each generation owes nothing to the past. Each generation receives nothing from the past that, that can't be simply overthrown and revised. And I, I think this brings us to, you know, to the heart of, uh, of what we're facing today. Because you know, I, after, I, just read after, a very, yeah, I just read a very interesting scientific paper that's oddly relevant to this. It's really revolutionary. I think it was published in Nature. And uh, it showed, no, there's this idea that's common currency among evolutionary biologists that mutations are entirely random. And this turns out not to exactly be true. And so there's a hierarchy of genetic stability. And the older the genes are that code for the properties of a given organism, the more likely those genes are to be restored to their original condition if a mutation does occur by DNA repair mechanisms. Right. So, so the yeah. reason I think this is so relevant is you imagine that our, the presumptions that make up our society and stabilize them have a hierarchical structure. And some of them are old and deep. And one of the oldest and deepest would be the idea that men and women alike are made in the image of God. Um, and so that's a very fundamental proposition. And then you might say that, well, the more fundamental a proposition is, the more other propositions depend on it. And then you might say, it's those most fundamental propositions that have to be transmitted from generation to generation. The more peripheral propositions, which are newer, and they would be akin to newer genetic variations in a given organism, the more they're free to vary because not so many things depend on them. And they should vary because they, their fundamental nature is still up in the air in some sense. But there's a hierarchy of presumptions and the deeper the presumption, the less, the less it should be amenable to change. I think that can be worked out on the conservative side. 
I, I think so. I, I, I mean, I, I, I think you're describing exactly what I'm describing just from another field. Yeah. By the way, um, th there's this uh, really fascinating passage in, in, in Hayek, in Friedrich Hayek, um, who, you know, the uh, uh, great economist and, and liberal thinker from the middle of, middle of the last century, um, he, he, he argues that there's a, uh, th that the emergence of the picture of science as an evolutionary process by trial and error is the, is the transference of the old common law idea of the law as evolutionary, yep. the constitution as evolutionary. The transfer of that was completely natural you know, for for uh, for English and Scottish thinkers who 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 knew that that the law was supposedly evolved this way to begin thinking in yep. the same way about science as trial and error, and and you know that that you know that that obviously could easily have inspired uh, uh, Darwin as well. Well, then we 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 could think about English common law the same way. So, English common law. In, tell me if I've got any of the details of this wrong, but basically under the English system, the presumption is human beings have all the rights there are intrinsically. And then when people come together and have a dispute, the dispute has to be adjudicated. And once it's adjudicated, that becomes a common law principle. And then those principles are supposed to be bound by precedent. And so then the presuppositions in English common law that have the most precedent are the most fundamental. And so it's an incrementally transforming structure, but, it, but it's also hierarchically structured. And it differs from, let's say, the French civil code. It certainly differs from systems of thought like Marxism, which are all rational creations and imposed from the top down. And so English common law did have this bottom-up nature, which gives it, well, I would say, in some sense, a preeminent status among legal codes around the world. It's, it's a remarkable it's a remarkable body of work. Yep, it is. Let me just add, I, I think your description is apt. Let me ju just add a couple of, of, of points to that. Uh, one of them is that the, the, uh, the common law is, uh, is a development uh, coming down the centuries of biblical law. If you go, you know, go back to the, the earliest formulations of legal codes in, in Britain, um, a lot of it is taken literally explicitly directly from uh, fr from from law codes in Hebrew scripture and a second point that's that's important is that um, is that what you're describing the uh, the uh, the jostling among individuals uh, which then create cases that set precedents um, that also happens at the constitutional level not not only at the at the at the level of individuals uh, uh, competing with one another um, you know, for for for, uh, uh, for rights, but also if you look at um, uh, you look at Magna Carta and the Petition of Right and the English Bill of Rights, and then after that the the American Bill of Rights. If if you look at that as a uh, as an ongoing um, uh, uh, jostling between uh, between the executive, which you know originally the king, and the legislature, which was originally the nobles. And the, uh, what you see is exactly this kind of uh, trial and error to find the right balance, which goes on for, literally goes on for, for a thousand years. And the, the, the constitution that, um, that the Americans in 1787 took upon themselves, if you, if you compare it to uh, the earlier English Petition of Right and Bill of Rights, you'll see that virtually all of the rights that, that appear in the American Constitution are actually things that were already worked out right, right. over centuries in, in, in this trial and error effort to find the right balance in England. So, so this means Jefferson is wrong because he didn't, in, in, in the manner that you described, um, that each successive generation is a foreign territory compared to the previous because he's not taking into account the hierarchical nature hierarchical nature of fundamental social presuppositions and so he might yep. be correct on the fringe and the periphery but at the core he's wrong and the case that you're making yep. is that 
while you have the American constitutional axioms, let's say, including exp expanded to include the Bill of Rights, but that's grounded in English common law. That's a consequence of centuries of trial and error. It's, and it's, it's not, you know, it's, not a, it's trial and error in a very particular way because imagine that you and I have a dispute and we, uh, 300 years ago, and we go in front of an English court the court has to rule in relationship to the dispute in a manner that's commensurate with all previous rulings of that broad type. And then the rulings have to be consistent enough with grounded human intuitions of what constitutes a just settlement so that when the settlement is handed down, the parties involved actually find it acceptable enough not to degenerate into murder. Uh, that's... Super well, super well said. I, I I think that's exactly exactly the point. And if you if you now want to ask, um, let's say that we we go with Jefferson for a moment, and we say um, actually, you know, using reason, like we can we we can just come up with what what the right answer is in 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 the 1700s. We don't we don't need the you know 800 years of. Uh, of trial and error before that. If you go with Jefferson, where you end up is with a view that says, "Look, I exercised reason. I don't need I I, I don't need tradition because I can exercise reason. I don't need an inheritance of of ideas and principles uh, and and precedents because I can just use reason." If you go in that direction, what happens is that even though your intentions are liberal and not Marxist. Your, your intention is just to allow people to be free of previous generations, that's all, to think for themselves. If you do that, then what, whatever, what you will come up with is something that it, 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 it runs down, it actively, aggressively runs down the, the inheritance of common sense and precedence and intuitions that people have, have, have gotten. Well, and then, then the, you end well, up with- what is this yeah. logic? What is this? this reason that the liberals are stressing precisely. I mean, if you, if you investigate that from a psychological perspective, I mean, you could think about it as the application of pure logic, but that's foolish because people just aren't that logical and very few people are trained to think logically in any case. And then with regards to reason itself, unless you're a radical empiricist and you believe that the pathway forward and the guardrails are self-evident as a consequence of exposure to the facts, which is naive beyond belief, then your reason is an empty concept. Because, I mean, if we're reasoning with language, let's say, which, which would be the most reasonable way of reasoning, because you can communicate with other people that way, every single bloody word you use was crafted by other people. Every phrase has a history. Every sentence is a fragment of a philosophical tradition, and then every profound idea is very unlikely to be original. And so the very tools of reason itself are established by, not only by tradition, but by a, an unbelievably profound hierarchical consensus. Because you and I couldn't even speak unless almost everything we said to each other was comprehensible because of our shared set of assumptions. Again, we can play on the fringes, right? I mean, as long as we're 99% in agreement, we can talk about the 1% where we differ and we can nibble away at the edges. But if we were radically different in our orientation and our individual reason, we couldn't even talk. Right. Uh, by the way, this point is um, uh, already made explicitly by... Uh, by Selden, in, in uh, John Selden, the, the 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 great common lawyer and constitutional scholar, um, in 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 the early 1600s, that that every single word that we use is something that was crafted by previous generations, and that's the basis uh, for for our capacity to 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 be able to live together. Now, the to go back to your uh, 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 a question that you you started with, if you have a society that has a common inheritance. Okay, now I'm not saying that everybody has to agree on everything, but there is exactly, as you said, there's a, an inheritance in which 90% or 95% or 98% of, 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 of what we think has been 
inherited and we agree on it, and then we argue, you know, as you say, on the fringes, that's a, that is a very good description of a successful, cohesive uh, 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 polity in which there are competing parties, in, in, in which there are, you know, you, you can have dem, dem, uh, democratic votes, you can have transitions from the rule of one party to another, but all of this depends on a, a mutual recognition among the different parties that they're part of one inheritance and uh, th that they're willing to honor one another because even though they disagree, they may hate each other, but, but they understand that, that, that they're part of one structure, as you said, one, one inherited logic. And what we've done today is to say, no, we don't need any of that. Yeah. We don't need any of that. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how much of it you, you uproot and thro throw out because we trust the, the new human reason that the revolutionaries are going to come up with to be something that, better than what we inherited. Well, I and think, I think you really argument. see this. I really believe that you see the most egregious example of this in our willingness to redefine the meaning of man and woman. Because I, my psychological studies have led me to the presumption that there might not be any more fundamental perceptual category than man and woman, than male and female. And there's the direct perception of that on the biological front, which is a precondition for successful reproduction, we should point out, in case it has to be pointed out. And then there are symbolic echoes of masculine and feminine that pervade almost everything we conceptualize. So you see that echoed, for example, in the Taoist conception of reality as yin and yang, which is a masculine and feminine dichotomy. There's this bipolarity of cognition that has as its fundamental basis the distinction between the sexes. And, you know, when, when Canada moved in 2016 to force the reconstruction of pronouns onto an uh, unsuspecting unsus population, in the name of compassionate narcissism, I thought, well, because this is such a fundamental cognitive category, if we introduce entropy into it, if we introduce disorder, then we're going to destabilize those who are already quite disordered and the most likely to be destabilized in that manner would be adolescent girls because that there's historical precedent for that. And so, this idiot insistence that all conceptions are up for grabs belies the fact that there's a hierarchy of perception in, in relationship to the different degrees of depths of different perceptions. And it replaces hierarchical order not with the freedom that's promised by the Marxists and the liberals, but with absolute bloody intolerable chaos. And when we, I do believe that we're in a Tower of Babel situation in a real sense, is that we've become intellectually pretentious beyond belief. We're building scaffolds that are in principle designed to replace God, and now we've reached an uh, impasse where we no longer speak the same language. We can't even decide what constitutes a man and what constitutes a woman, and if you can't agree on that, then I don't think there's anything that you can agree on. And, and so if you ask, you know, what does the individual, man or woman, today facing uh, the, the, this this the, the, uh, um, the, this permanent cultural revolution, which is uprooting the most fundamental things that have been inherited, the most fundamental concepts that we we use to understand reality are being smashed. So, where do they turn? And here, I you know I I understand that this could be controversial for all sorts of people, but I I. I think the bottom line is that a that if you see the revolution coming, you understand it's going to destroy everything. You understand there's 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 going to literally be nothing that is not uprooted. If you see this, what's the force that that could stop it? Well, the force that could stop it is is fundamentally um, young men and young women, young families, older older men and older women, find going. To, to, to that institution which continues to hand down traditions intact 
which is in our society is almost only at this point uh, the church, the, the the Orthodox churches. I, uh, Orthodox, I, I, I mean yeah, theologically, traditionally. Uh, w- whether they're w- right, whether they're Catholic or Protestant or or, or ortho- Orthodox doctrinally, uh, or, or or the synagogue or some other traditional community in which a life of conservation and transmission is actually taking place. It, 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 it you know it be, it begins with. Um, uh, young people saying, "Look, I need to be part of. I need to be part of a community." But the next step is to say it can't just be, you know, any arbitrary community. It can't be, you know, like like uh, a, a bunch of eighteen-year-olds uh, in a dorm room. We're going to set up a community because because they're not they're not actually that's engaged a gang, in not a community. Conserva- right? They're not they're not engaged in conserving and transmitting anything. Right? And so the only way that you can plug yourself into uh, this, the, the, the chain of conservation and transmission which has been lost is to find older people, to find older people who've seen it done. I mean, you, you're, not, you're, you're not going to be able to keep a marriage together if you don't have actual living models of older people who have succeeded in keeping a mar- marriage together so you can see what it's like so that you can, you can pick it up from them. And the same th- thing is true for, for, for everything else. If you want to save yourself, right? And I mean, I, I think this is true nationally also, but at, at, at the moment, if you as an individual, you want to save yourself. Now, I'm not... I'm not Talking about the Christian question about like your eternal salvation. I, I, I'm 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 Jewish. I'm talking about you want to save yourself in this life in this world, all right. And then what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to. I, I know this is difficult, but you're going to have to go to older people who have a functioning congregation and say, look, I'm coming here to learn. I'm not coming here to judge you. I'm not coming here to, you know, to preach the things I believe. I'm coming here to learn how a life of conservation and transmission used to work. I I want to learn that to see whether I can be part of it. That is a very big change. The best way to fight the oncoming revolution is, uh, as you say, the oncoming chaos is with order and that, but but you can't create that order yourself. You you have to be a part of some existing order, and luckily it still exists. So, in relationship to your comments earlier about the conservatives thinkers, who I think we should also go through, by the way, making the case that things did fall apart of their own accord. There's a a thinker, Mircea Eliade, a great historian of religions, who track the commonalities among flood myths across very many different cultures and came up with a formula for why God or the gods would become angry enough to destroy everything in a, in a, in a chaotic catastrophe. And he said, well, the first issue is that things deteriorate of their own accord. And that's Just an observation about the effect of entropy, I would say, is that things fall apart. If you just leave them sit, they'll fall apart by themselves because things decay. And then Eliad also said that a very common theme was that that process of entropic decay was sped along by the sins of men. And what he meant by that was the proclivity for people to be willfully blind. And so imagine that There are small things going wrong in your marriage. Your wife becomes less attentive or you do. Your attention starts to be attracted by other people and you just let it slide. You know that something's up, but you don't do the attentive work necessary to do the repairs when the time is appropriate. Well, then you speed the process of decay. And so one of the implications of this was that The central organizing principle of the psyche, and this might be the principle to which religious systems to some degree put forward as the highest possible good, is something like constant attention to that process of decay and communication about it to stem off the ravages of time. 
You could think about that as an organizing principle of the psyche, a necessary organizing principle of the psyche. So the god Horus, for example, in the ancient Egyptian pantheon was the all-seeing eye that paid attention and who could see corruption when it emerged. And the Mesopotamian god Marduk was, had eyes all the way around his head and spoke magic words. And so that seemed to be something like a core organizing principle. And you talked about these, these cardinal, canonical, conservative thinkers um, and their willingness to make the presumption that things did go wrong and needed to be fixed. Maybe we could go through them a little bit, if you don't mind. Fortescue, Hooker, Selden, and Burke. And well, you, you know, before before we launch into them, let let me let me just say something about um, about the the, the biblical uh, flood myth and its uh, uh, f- flood story, I should say, and its relationship uh, to, to the conversation that we're that, that we're having. The um, Eliada's uh, mapping is helpful, uh, but there is a big difference between. Uh, between the Mesopotamian flood myth, uh, where you have basically the gods get angry because human beings are annoying, and yeah. human beings are bothering them, they're tr- they're troublesome. Right. When when that story in that story in in you know in in, in the hands of uh, of, of uh, Moses and the, the Israelite prophets, that story uh, becomes one of um, of gods. Intention of creating, you know, a, 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 an Edenic world, a, a perfect world where, where human beings and animals um, are are all eating grasses and vegetables, and no, you know, no creature hurts another creature. And the w- w- what you see in the biblical account is that uh, that the world is in, has this intrinsic the, the 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 chaotic waters that God's God's wind or God's spirit is fashions the world out of, those chaotic waters never, you know, they, they, they never fully go away. Mm-hmm. They're all, all mm-hmm. always constantly about to happen. And, and that affects uh, human nature in that human beings are incapable of living in this perfect world that, you know, that God imagined uh, in, in, in Eden. The flood story actually um, has almost the, you know, the, the opposite meaning because what, what God D- discovers from the flood is that he thought that he was going to give Noah and 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 uh, Noah's children a you know a chance to create the perfect world. The moment that that the flood is over, Noah starts getting drunk. There's sexual impropriety. There's also the, you know there's all sorts of awful things that immediately happen to Noah, who is supposed to be the best of you know the best of uh, of human beings, and that creates a. A, a religious framework in which God says, all right, I can't perfect the world. I have no way of perfecting the world. It's not within my power to do that, which is not exactly the way that it's often presented, but that's what it says in the text, is that God doesn't have the, the power to create a perfect world, and he needs human beings to take up a, a role as his you know his vice regents as his uh, 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 associates and assistants in 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 trying to fix in trying to fix the world and that structure notice that it's a hierarchical structure it's 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 not a metaphor of an all powerful god that we should just obey it's a different metaphor it's a metaphor of a a a god who actually needs our help he could destroy the whole world but he can't fix it without our help that's the fundamental um, structure that makes Judaism and later Christianity different from the preceding religions, is that there is a role for man within the hierarchy of the cosmos. God needs us, and the, the covenant is about us stepping forward and shoulder, shouldering that responsibility. In an economy as volatile as this one, it's important to have control when you're making a big purchase like a new car. That's where Carzing comes into play. 
Carzing is completely changing the way you buy a car online. An online car shopping website with millions of listed vehicles, Carzing works with over 25,000 dealers nationwide to help you find your dream car. By partnering with credit agencies, lenders, and dealerships, Carzing provides you with everything you need before stepping foot into a dealership. Their mission is to make auto financing quick and easy while providing a modern, hassle-free way of shopping for cars. Their innovative technology and financial tools provide consumers with the ability to instantly pre-qualify online without affecting your credit score. Plus, you can search for vehicles with instant financing details, including down payment, monthly payment, term, and APR. Once you find your dream car at your ideal budget, all you have to do is bring your saved deal voucher with you to the dealership to finalize your next ride. Carzing offers transparency to the max. You know your purchasing options before you set foot into the dealership, which makes the whole process so much more convenient. Visit carzing.com slash Jordan today to skip the guesswork and find the best deals near you. That's carzing.com slash Jordan. So the other thing that I've seen, another thing that I've seen on my tours is that the call to responsibility has become somewhat of a clarion call. And, you know, you can see the Marxists and the environment and the environmental types as well capitalizing on the attractiveness of responsibility and destiny to some degree by offering these utopian schemes as a, as a sort of messianic alternative to anim, the enemy of liberalism. Let's, let's put it that way. The conservative approach seems to me to be something more like, um, what would you call it? The pursuit of responsibility in humble micro domains at least to begin with, right? So that to set yourself right, you should try to set your family relationships right and maybe to establish a family. And having established a certain degree of harmony and functionality in your family, then maybe you could extend out a few tentacles into the surrounding civic community and you could build from the bottom up. You could build a stable life and a stable social life and then a stable political life, let's say, from the bottom up as a, and it, one of the things that I've been heartened by is the fact that if you lay out those arguments to young people, you say, look, you need to be embedded in a social surround and you need to take responsibility for it. And the reason you need that is because that's where you're going to find the purpose of your life. That sounds to me like an echo of this biblical insistence that there actually is something for human beings to do, as long as they don't bite off more than they can chew and get all prideful about it. You, you, you said maybe maybe start a family. So you know, I this might be controversial with some of some some, some of your viewers, but in 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 the Jewish version of the biblical tradition, in the Jewish tradition, the the starting a family is an obligation that everyone who can do it must do it. Right. And if 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 you if you if you think about that in ter in terms of the responsibility issue. It, Young uh, Orthodox Jews are raised to believe that that if that if you don't take on this responsibility, if if you you as a young man, if you don't you don't make it your business to 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 find a wife and to have children and to uh, to create a, to to do what it takes to to create a stable structure, you're, you're going to be for your entire life unable to understand what it actually takes in order to create uh, to create human order I mean the 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 the, the you know the various people have noticed that the European that that many of the European leaders uh, are are unmarried and don't have children um, and the uh, the 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 situation in which um, young people don't learn how to they, they don't learn how to govern. They don't learn how to uh, to be a king and a queen in their own homes. They don't know how to govern a family. They don't know how to ha how to hold it together, uh, despite the you know the incredible pain and difficulties that 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 often takes place uh, between men and women. And and, uh, and and children aren't you know children are you know they're sometimes fun, but they're sometimes incredibly difficult, incredibly painful to raise. This this whole concept that every every young man and woman who can do it 
must take the responsibility to bring life into the world, to create the world anew, to try to build up on the basis of what's been inherited, to try to make it better than what it was in, in previous generations. That, that view, I, I, I think in, in many ways, that's like a, the, the bedrock um, Jewish and Christian view, which says, you know, we're not, sla- we're not slaves to the gods. We're, we're partners in creating this world, but that, that means we have an obligation to do the act of creation. And the, the, the most fundamental act of creation is creating a family. Once you've done that, then, uh, you know, you, you, you were hinting to this, that then I think you can also learn to create congregations, to uphold uh, uh, nations. All of that flows from the first step of very young people taking responsibility for creating, you know, b- basically their own little world in a family. Well, there is no more profound responsibility than that. And so it's an initiation into profound responsibility. I mean, one of the things that happens to a parent that, and I think it's very difficult for this to happen if you don't become a parent, is that once you're a parent, there is definitely someone in your life who's more important than you are, right? So your your orientation to the world well, I would say it matures properly, and it matures under the force of moral obligation, fundamentally. You have this person now who's, for better or worse, almost entirely dependent on your not-so-tender mercies, you and your wife, and who's subject to all of your trials and tribulations and inadequacies, and if you have any sense at all, that wakes you up as much as anything will. And without that, I think it's very difficult to shed the constraints of hedonistic adolescence. That's not good right, for people, you, just, you know, it's not good for people. If you, you just go, so go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's exactly true. I think I, I, as you said, you, you can't, you can't in a lot of ways, you can't actually mature uh, until you've created and are the, uh, the government of the, uh, uh, of a household. And the alternative that, that, uh, that sort of mainstream liberalism gives us this uh, the, the, this view that you know you, when when you reach eighteen or twenty years old you're a you're a rational individual and you know now you can do whatever you want you can and usually doing whatever you want we can see in young people that doing whatever you want means that th- they get too scared to get married they get too scared to have children. The, 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 uh, even I'm, I'm talking about something that even affects, even affects Orthodox religious communities. You can see it very, very clearly that, that, the, um, uh, that they look at, at, um, at these responsibilities as a kind of, uh, w- with, with terrible fear, as though it's like, a, like an enslavement, something, something they, need, they need to spend another five years and another 10 years and another five years, get more degrees. You know, they need to keep preparing in order to be ready to do it. And th- that, that's the, the opposite of the traditional view that says, that says take the responsibility and, and then live up to it. You'll grow by living up to it. You'll become a complete person, as the rabbis say. You complete yourself by entering, taking the responsibility of marriage and children. And the, the alternative of is, is adolescence that's extended forever. What, you think that when you're, that, that when you're 35 years old and, uh, and, and now you're going to start looking to get married, it's going to be easier to get married? You, you, you'll, you'll actually be more capable of it than you were when you were 23? I, I, don't, I don't think that's true at all. I, I, I think what you learn during those extra 10 or 15 years of adolescence is, is to, to just care for yourself instead of to learn how to create mm-hmm. something, to learn well, how that, to, that to, also, to command something. That idea also highlights in some sense both the practical necessity and the inevitability of faith or, or the lack thereof. I mean, many things in your life you have to throw yourself into without first knowing that you can do it. And I I don't mean to do that in an impulsive and foolish manner, like heedless of all risks. I mean that when you get married, you don't know if it's going to work. And in some sense, that's even a foolish question because the issue is that when you decide to get married, 
It's the first and foremost decision among 50,000 decisions that are going to determine whether or not you can stay married. And you can boil that down to a question like, did I marry the right person? And the answer to that is always no. And they didn't marry the right person either. And because neither of you are the right person in your current unbelievably flawed condition. And so, but you throw yourself into it thinking that having faith that you can manage it and also having faith that the alternative, that no matter how dismal the reality, the alternative is likely to be far worse. And I would say the same thing is true on the child rearing front, which is, as you pointed out, it's difficult. It isn't obvious that you're prepared or that extra preparation is really going to help you. But what's the alternative to the difficulty? One of the things I love about the story of Abraham, one of the things I think that makes it such a profound story is that Abraham is really characterized by quite the protracted adolescence according to the beginning of the story. He's quite old when God finally convinces him to get the hell out of his tent and to get out there in the world. And God in that story is definitely manifest, manifests himself as the call to adventure, even to the pathologically underdeveloped, the call to adventure. And of course, Abraham just steps into any number of catastrophes as soon as he leaves the confines of his tent and his, and his father's home. But the story is a triumph in its totality, because despite the fact that he encounters tyranny and the likely loss of his wife, at the hands of people who are essentially tyrants and starvation and war and all of the catastrophes of life, he has a great adventure. And that's the adventure, as far as I can tell, it's something like the adventure of truth and dedication and responsibility. And that's very seldom mar marketed, you know, by conservatives to young people as an adventure, right? And you said their default position is often to regard these strictures of community as what would you call it, impediments and impositions on their hedonic freedom. But there's very little of value in that hedonic freedom. And all of the adventure in life, as far as I can tell, is to be found, weirdly enough, in truth and responsibility. Yep, I, 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 I completely agree. You, you, have, um, uh, you have God telling Abraham, look, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you an opportunity uh, to become a great nation, to uh, uh, become a, a, a great tradition, to become a, to, to become a, a teacher of all the peoples in the world, but you know that's the biggest adventure that you know that the prophets could imagine was setting out to become a teacher to the entire world and to and to create a great nation that would influence the whole world and 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 would be in covenant with god they the, the prophets can't imagine a, a larger scale adventure than that and yet the whole thing pivots around you take a wife you have to have a child you have to raise that child that that involves hardship. That involves difficulty. And you know, there's all of these descriptions of Ab Abraham's adventures, and and you know, it, it it takes many generations until you can see the consequences of what of 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 you know the full consequences of what he did. But the first step is taking responsibility, as you say. And now we have to ask. We have to. I mean, now we're talking about you know tens of millions of young people and not so young people who are beginning to realize that you know that 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 a career meaning you know like the your 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 place within the corporate economy your you know which cubicle you get getting to that corner office that that's nowhere near the adventure of cr cr creating a family which is creating a little nation which then has the opportunity to grow if you do it right I mean, really, these two things are basically um, uh, battling with one another. Uh, w w which of them is more important? And the 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 answer will you know you can have both. Sometimes it's true, but but it's it's terribly misleading. It's terribly misleading because because that cubicle in which you know you sit in front of that computer com computer screen and try to you know move yourself up in the in 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 the the, the corporate game. 
that, that's not a life of conservation and transmission. That's not a life of responsibility. That, you know, that it, for most people, it's almost nothing, actually. And, and, and so what we really need to be telling people is, um, is look, enough, enough with the fear. Enough with the fear. Come, come join a, a religious community, a congregation in which people did get married when they were young and they did have children, and, 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 and come see what it's like. By, by the way, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the commandment of, of uh, uh, being fruitful and having children is, is only one part of your place in the hierarchy. The, uh, another part of your place in the hierarchy is the commandment to honor, honor your parents. And, and that also is something that young people find incredibly difficult. Whenever I speak in front of young audiences, the moment that I mention, the moment that I mention, you know, honoring your father and your mother, honoring your teachers, the, immediately somebody says, well, well, you know, only if they deserve to be honored, right? I mean, you're not talking about honoring them, you know, if, if they're terrible. And of course, that loophole basically allows you know, every single individual young man and woman in the audience to say, well, you know, my parents are, you know, I, I judge my parents, they're not, you know, they're not, not worthy of being honored. That it, it begins by going away to college and you don't need to talk to them anymore. And it ends by putting your parents in an old age home uh, so, and paying somebody else to take care of them in old age. Again, you know, just simply dumping responsibility on somebody else, paying somebody else to take the responsibility. And, and both parts of this, the, the, the fear of bringing children in the world, but also the refusal, the refusal to admit the biblical truth that you have a lifelong ob obligation to honor your parents, your father and your mother. You, you don't choose whether to have that obligation or not. This is like, you know, it, it, this, is, this, this is both barrels against the fundamental assumption of liberalism, which, which is that you, you, you choose your obligations, but you don't choose your obligations. You don't choose which family you're born into. You, 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 you don't choose who your parents are or who, who your brothers are or who your sisters are. You, you don't even choose who your children are. And so all of these in the end are, are unchosen obligations. And the, the, the question is, you know, are you, strong, are, are, are you gonna develop the strength of personality, the, the, the power and the wisdom and, 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 and the ability to uphold these responsibilities in a way that's impressive and classy and, and, and powerful and, and, and it can also be magnificent. You know, you, you get to a certain age and, and, and you've got, um, you know, all of these decades of, of um, you know, I, I, think, I think of my, you know, my, my aunt and uncle uh, who, who uh, uh, they're in their 80s now and uh, Orthodox Jews in Israel and they, uh, uh, they took a, a, um, a, 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 a drone photograph uh, of them with the, you know, 90 of their, uh, their biological and adopted descendants who, who came to like a picnic. And you look, you look at this and you say, you know, they, 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 they built an empire. They, I mean, they, they've begun to, you know, to alter the face of the world with what, what they did. What, what about you? Are, are you know, you, you're just going to sit it out? No, that honor too. You know, I've, I've been thinking about many of the injunctions on the religious side as moral efforts. So faith, for example, you can pillory it as blind insistence that something that no one could possibly believe to be true is true. Or you could say, no, faith is the courage that it requires to leap into the unknown and to wrestle with possibility itself. And you could think of honor the same way, is that, you know, I read this book by Frank McCourt called Angela's Ashes, and in that book, he talks about his father back in Ireland. They were a very poor Irish family. And uh, his father was an absolutely unrepentant alcoholic who drank up every cent the family ever made and had many, many children, number of whom developed very serious illnesses as a consequence of the poverty induced by the father's drinking and some of whom died. And Frank had the wisdom, even as a young man, to sort of divide his father into two parts. There was sober, useful, productive, encouraging morning father, and then there was nighttime and binge father. And 
He did everything he could to extract out the encouraging patriarchal spirit from the best that his father had to offer. And it seems to me that that's something like honor, you know, and to honor your parents, to honor your wife, to honor your siblings is to is to have the best in you serve the best in them. It's something like that. It's active, right? It's it's it it requires effort, like courage requires effort. It's yeah. it it's not something you do blindly and foolishly. And so when people say, well, my parents have done things that make them less than honorable in my eyes, I mean, there's two rejoinders to that. The first is, well, and what makes you so perfect? And so Who exactly is it within you that's doing this judging? And second, you have an obligation to work as hard as you can to foster the best in other people, and that would include your parents and your siblings and the people that you're close to. That's something you really work at, and that's the honoring. You know, when my wife and I got married, to speak personally for a a bit, one of the things we did decide was that we were going to honor each other as husband and wife. And so we try, tried very hard, for example, not to put each other down, particularly in public. And, not, and that wasn't because we weren't often irritated with one another, because obviously, if you live with someone, irritation emerges. It's because you have a duty to honor your wife or your husband. And if you don't uphold that duty, then you denigrate the relationship and you make yourself look like an utter fool too. You know, if you don't treat your wife with a certain amount of respect, well, first of all, it 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 does her no good, but it also does no you no good. You entered into the relationship. You have a moral obligation to keep it as pristine as you can in your public utterances. And that's part of the necessary responsibility that provides a scaffold for the relationship. Same with your parents. Yeah, I, 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 I would add that it's not just the public utterances. I of mean, course. The, you know, the, there's uh, everybody at this point has you know the, the these Hollywood images of uh, you know of uh, uh, happy marriages, which, you know, which just sort of like magically everybody's having a good time, and unhappy marriages where people are 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 are, are you know are are are, are constantly in, insulting and abusing one another, and what 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 is missing from you know this simplified version of marriage is that you know you you simply don't have to say everything you think all the time, and part of um, an integral part of uh, liberalism is the, you know, I want to express myself. I, you know, I, I, f- I feel something, so I want to say it. I want to tell people with, with the, the assumption being that, that if you say everything you think, then, you know, then you'll persuade the other, you know, your, 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 your wife or your parents, you persuade the world of, you know, the truth of your view. But, you know, empirically we say, you know, we can see that's, that that isn't remotely true. If you say everything you think all the time, um, then what happens is that that you hurt your wife over and over and over again, and you bring her to the point where she, you know, e- even the things that she could do, you know, that you want her to do, she she, she finds pay- painful, and she starts hurting you back. I mean, the 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 whole traditional view that honoring means sometimes you don't say the truth. Okay, I'm not saying that you you know you should lie to your wife or, or or your husband. God forbid. I'm not talking about that. But I'm I, I, I'm saying that that for every ten criticisms that you know come to you of you know about your wife, it might be that only one of them is worth saying, and mm-hmm. that one maybe shouldn't be worth saying. It shouldn't be said now. Maybe it should be said later. Well, there's actually maybe it should be said. You know, you know, there's empirical data on that. So if you track the utterances of married couples and then you use the utterance tracking to predict the longevity of the relationship, it was found that if the relationship deteriorates to the point where there's one negative comment for every five positive comments, then the relationship doesn't maintain itself. 
So 20% negative is too high. But interestingly enough, there's a bound on the other end too, which is that if the positive to the negative exceeds 11 to 1, the relationship also tends to deteriorate. And so it's something like judicious communication, right? You don't have to make a case that every time something irritates you, that turns into a war. But you can't be a pushover or, a, or someone who is naively blind and expect the relationship to maintain itself as well. So th this is, you know, th th this is actually one of the the central arguments that uh, that I make in in my conservatism book, which is that honoring, which which is purposely trying to uh, the 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 uh, in he in in Hebrew the word is lechabed for for honoring. The word is to literally make someone heavy to to you know like. Uh, um, uh, in English, we can we can say uh, uh, the, the cer certain statements or certain words were uh, were significant. Uh, he here, we're talking about um, uh, making an individual significant by by making them weighty, giving giving weight to their words, saying it was important that you did that. It was good that you did that. This is actually the key to creating a loyal relationship. People feel, people don't feel loved if they're not being honored. People don't feel good if they're not being honored. They, if they're not being honored, they, 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 they begin to hate, they begin to resent. And so you can say this with respect to, to husbands and wives, you can say this with respect to children's, children relating to their parents, but you can also, I mean, take a look politically at you know, what, it, what's happening in America, what's happening in other de democratic countries where where the uh, the competing political parties, the competing tribes, no longer honor one another. Right. And you know all you need all you need to do is to you know go back to the uh, you know to, to 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 the the Nixon Kennedy Kennedy debates from the 1960s or the the the, the Ray, Ray, Reagan uh, uh, Reagan Mondale debates from the 80s and just look. Look at those videos of the way they treat one another. I mean, it may be that in their hearts they hate one another and they think they're they're dangerous people. But look at the way they talk. They they they're constantly giving honor to the other side because they 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 value the fact that that if the other side wins, then they're going to be the loyal opposition. They'll do their best to honor them until the next election. Hopefully, they'll win. Now, I don't want to turn this into something like you know too too uh, uh, um, dreamy or utopian, but the difference between you know, what th that kind of politics and the politics we have today, wh which consists you know, of this constant, constant drumbeat of insult, abuse, slander, dishonoring one another. Look, it's just like a marriage. If you want a divorce, if you want a civil war, then just keep dishonoring the other person. Just keep focusing on everything that's wrong with them and you'll, you'll, you'll get your divorce, you'll get your civil war. So you're construing honor as something like respect and encouragement. I mean, one of the things that B.F. Skinner, who was famously able to train animals to do almost anything, he pointed out that the most effective behavior modification technique to put it rather coldly, was the use of targeted reward. And so he would watch animals, and when they did something that was approximately appropriate to what he was trying to teach them to do, he would reward them. And so, for example, if he wanted to have a rat walk up a little ladder and do a dance on the top, he just watched the rat until it got close to the ladder, and when it got close to the ladder in its cage, he'd give it a food pellet, and then it would hang around the ladder more, and then Eventually, it would put a paw up on one of the rungs and he'd give it a food pellet. And soon he could get the rat climbing the ladder and doing a little dance on top and all sorts of complicated things. And he knew, he knew that you could shape behavior with threat and punishment, but that reward was much more effective, although it required a, a large degree of attention. One of the things I suggested to my clinical clients and in my lectures was that you pay very close attention to the people around you. And whenever they do something that you'd like to see them repeat, you let them know in some detail what it was that you observed. 
And that sounds like the manner in which you're construing honor, in addition to the respect element, which is to give credit where credit is due. Yeah, it, this is this is this is not simply give credit where credit is due, because uh, you know, as we said before, um, if your if your mindset is you know I'm judging, I'm critiquing, then you'll easily destroy. I mean, you'll you'll just destroy. Your, your, your parents' worthiness in your own eyes, your wife's worthiness in your own eyes, you just, your, your political rival's worthiness in your own, if that's what you're doing, you're saying, well, I'm gonna judge where it's due all the time, the, you're, not, you're not gonna make it. You're, you're not going to succeed in, in, in doing the action, the biblical action of giving honor. The biblical action of giving honor is, is, uh, is to, Elevate someone to make them to to make them feel like they are important and worthy. Not for you to judge whether they're worthy, for you to make them feel that they are worthy. And the, the I mean I, I the the the, uh, the comparison with, the, with with the rats is useful, but in this case we have we have uh, this this is going taking place in both directions between a husband and wife. If each of them, if if I tell my wife why she's worthy, right? she, she comes away feeling loved and strengthened and important. And if she does it back to me, then I come away feeling loved and strengthened and important. And, 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 and guess what? The, 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 the single relationship, that bond, is, is when it's strengthened from both sides in that way, it, it, it becomes something astonishing. I mean, it, even, you know the the whole thing about well, I, you know, I don't feel attracted to my wife. You know, of course you don't feel attracted to your wife because 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 you know you 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 were uh, uh, you you were you were a young person and you were in the the the, the throes of uh, hormonal ecstasy and that lasts for a few years. But the the key to an attraction is if if you keep making her feel worthy then she'll continue to feel attracted to you. And if she keeps making you feel worthy, then you'll keep feeling attracted to her. There's a, there's a direct connection between honoring somebody and, and, and their feeling a desire for you. And I, I'm, I'm including physical desire, all kinds of desire. And you know, all of these things are, are um, kind of secrets of the traditional society, which have been Wipe, wiped away by the uh, you know uh, along with the biblical tradition the the you know the, the assumption that we don't have anything learn, to learn from scripture or 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 from tradition basically is the key to our inability to to maintain long term any kind of loyalty so if you were going to extract out a message to young people and perhaps not just young people who are watching and listening from your work in relationship to how they should conduct their life. I mean, we've been touching on that the entire conversation. Um, what, what would you tell them in relationship to conservatism rather than liberalism or, or God forbid, let's say Marxism? Why tilt in the conservative direction if you're young? The most important about thing about tilt, tilting in a conservative direction is that you yourself have to have to lead a conservative life, right? I'm, I mean, th th there's importance in voting for conservatives, but this is this is not the key to the to, to the issue. The key to the issue is if you're voting for conservatives, but you're leading a liberal life, you're, you know, you're, you're 33 years old and you're living with a, uh, you know, you're, you're li living with a woman year after year, you go to the beach on the Sabbaths, you, you're not a member of any congregation, you, you don't read scripture, you're a thousand miles away from your parents, so you don't, you don't inherit anything from, from, from the community that you grew up in because you don't go to a congregation, you don't have a new community that you inherit from. You talk to your parents, you know, uh, on Thanksgiving, or I don't know, once a month. This, this whole construct is a liberal life. It is a life in which nothing is conserved and nothing is transmitted from one generation to the next. It doesn't make any difference how you vote if your personal life is one in which uh, you're not part of uh, the chain of, of transmission in a hierarchical society in which you learn to honor people who you didn't necessarily choose and 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 you 
uh, you know, as you get older and you, you, uh, uh, you, you get wiser and you, you accomplish uh, r- real things by creating a family, um, as, as you get older, you, you, you yourself become honored. You yourself become somebody who's, who's, who's worthy of that kind of honor, which means that you feel good about your life. Which uh, d- th- there isn't any any other way to do it other than than in this way, I believe. Right. So it's not a political issue fundamentally. What you're putting forward, it's, and it also seems to be commensurate with this idea that psychological well-being, which is a weak word, it's 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 happiness in the more classical sense, I would say, which had ties to virtue, is something that's practiced locally practiced personally, practiced within the family, practiced within the broader community and so forth in all these nested hierarchical structures. And that, that that's really the essence in some sense of conducting yourself in a sustainable and traditional manner. And the utility of that is that you actually get a full life and maybe you can live in a, some degree of productive peace and harmony with other people, which you know is probably preferable to horrible conflict and war. All of that's true. And in our current moment, I mean, it, it's always been true, but in our current moment, you know, where, where, where the alternatives are, are a deracinated liberalism or, or a, a Marxism whose purpose is just, you know, really is to destroy all of the inherited structures and knowledge that, that have come to us from previous generations. You know, I... I just, I, I can't see it. I can't understand how young people or even old people, you know, who's, um, who, whose kids went away to college and never came back, you know, wh- wh- why, not, why not try a, uh, a conservative congregation and, um, and, 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 and see whether that can uh, give you the kind of flowering that, that you, you know, you're looking for, but you don't have any other way to get it. I, I don't, I, I think this is the best thing that anyone can do to fight the cultural revolution and the woke madness is to, uh, f- to, to find a Christian or a, a Jewish or some other um, uh, co- congregation in which you can be experience inheriting and honoring, honoring and inheriting yourself and be, be a part of that. That's, you know, if, if, if people don't do that, um, the, the, there, there, there isn't there isn't much of a future. Well, that's a that's a salutary place to draw this conversation to a close. I would say uh, I'm going to talk to for all those who are listening and watching. I'm I'm going to talk to Dr. Hazoni for another half an hour on the DW Plus platform. I use that time to wander through my my guest's biography. I'm very interested in what sets people on a particular path and also interested in sharing what you might describe as the wisdom of success with as many people who are inclined to listen and watch. And so that'll happen on the Daily Wire Plus platform. In the meantime, thank you to all of you who are watching and listening. Your attention is much appreciated. And thank you, Dr. Yoram Hazoni, for speaking with me today. And, uh, for sharing your thoughts with with the listening and watching audience. Much appreciated, sir. My pleasure, thank you. Hello, everyone. I would encourage you to continue listening to my conversation with my guest on dailywireplus.com.